Today we're going to turn this into this with this. Today we're going to take a practical look at using the Carvera Air desktop CNC from Makera, which is aimed at making CNC machining as accessible as 3D printing to the home user. This is a pretty ambitious goal as 3D printing is incredibly forgiving when it comes to the manufacturability of a design. As long as you can remove the supports, you can print pretty much anything that fits on the build plate. CNC machining takes quite a bit more upfront planning in the design phase as you're going to be limited to the tools and bits that are available for your machine. If the tool can't reach the surface of the part, then it's not getting made. If you want a full rundown of the machine basics and all the stuff that it comes with, there are a multitude of videos on YouTube right now that cover that in detail. In this one I want to talk specifically about making automotive parts and not just something that was generated from a 2D sketch with some embellishment to call it a 3D part. I did however cut exactly that as my first test piece and while I made plenty of chips with a full size Bridgeport mill, this was my first go at a CNC. For most of my projects if I need a small flange or something like that, I've got send cut send at my disposal, so I want to look at making a more complex functional part with this machine. Before we start cutting chips we need to take a step back and set our expectations because any desktop CNC is going to be built upon a number of compromises. You're not going to be taking five millimeter rough cut passes on a piece of aluminum with this machine. The core of any cutting machine is going to be the structure that it's built upon and this one has a cast aluminum frame. This will give us plenty of rigidity to cut aluminum. I have seen people claim to cut even harder materials like stainless steel albeit going at a much slower speed and a much slower step down rate, but I have not tried that so your mileage may vary. Like many desktop CNC's, this ships with a collet set up for 8th inch bits and you can swap that out for a 6 millimeter collet, but with a 200 watt spindle motor, you're really going to want to stick with the smaller diameter bits so that it has the ability to cut aluminum with at least some degree of authority. The other aspect of the machine as shipped that I wanted to upgrade before even getting started was the MDF bed. This is perfectly adequate and acceptable for most jobs that you would do, and it's actually a genius feature given the target audience for this machine, as it's going to be much more forgiving if you zig instead of zag and then plunge your bit into the bed. The Carvera ships with some hold down clamps, but for some of the multi-operation projects that I have in mind, I wanted a much greater degree of flexibility to accurately and rigidly hold the workpiece. For this, I installed this absolute unit of a fixture plate from Saunders Machine Works. It's a 17.8 millimeter thick piece of precision machined aluminum that features an array of M6 threaded holes on 20 millimeter centers to choose from. It's also available in quarter 20 threads if you're into that sort of thing. I paired this with their modular vice system to have a solid foundation for gripping the part that we're going to machine here. The plate is also designed with all the locating pin holes and fastener locations of the supplied MDF plate so that it can accommodate any of the supplied clamps or accessories. Speaking of accessories, the most interesting one that comes with the machine for me is the fourth axis. This means we'll be able to accurately index and rotate the part to create round features similar to a lathe and it also comes with a laser module which might be useful in the future for creating gaskets. That's enough about the machine, so let's take a look at the part that we're going to cut today. I'm using these Dime PSI Quick Connect fittings for almost all of my plumbing and needed to come up with a drain fitting for my Borg Warner 8374. Dime does offer an NPT fitting, but I'm not a fan of taper threads. I decided this would be a great opportunity to put the Carvera Air through its paces because we're going to have a first operation to rough cut some stock and make some tool clearance by removing some material, put it in the fourth axis for most of the material removal and then set it back up for a three axis operation to machine the o-ring groove, the oil drain taper pocket, as well as the bolt holes. While CNC machining is quite different from 3D printing, one similarity is that both of these machines run on G-code to tell the spindle which way to move in the X, Y, or Z position. However, for CNC machining, we use CAM software rather than a slicer. Makera has their own Makera CAM software, which is aimed at being very easy to use for the beginner, and that's what we're going to use for all the operations in this project. There are also turnkey profiles available so that you can use the CAM feature in Autodesk Fusion. The CAM software is actually really intuitive where you just set your material stock size, import your model, align it with that stock, and then start selecting features from which you want to remove material from. I did encounter some quirks with the CAM software, and to be fair, this is a beta release, so it might be related to that. For example, if I created a pocket operation and then I wanted to create another one, and when I went to generate the path, it would say that no tool was selected, even though a tool was listed, and there's no option to click on that tool or change the tool. I had to close out of the program, reopen it, and then I'd be able to finish the operation. Additionally, if you create a tool path that's not valid, it will still create the operation in the menu list, 
but there won't be a toolpath associated with it. So you really need to make sure that you see the white line that is representative of the toolpath to ensure that it was successfully created. With this being aimed at a beginner audience, I think it would be beneficial to have some sort of warning or error to give an indication that something might not be right. And then finally, you are responsible for knowing the length of your bit. If you select a contour feature in a 30 millimeter thick piece of material and your bit will only cut 15 millimeters of depth, you will crash the machine. With my first attempt of a non-trivial series of CNC operations, I decided to try those on some tooling board, which is basically a block of epoxy before going to aluminum. This was a really good idea because I forgot to enable the step down feature, meaning the bit went directly to its final cut path with no regard for the material in front of it. Thankfully, this does come with an e-stop button, so there was no damage done other to my pride. So now after making an absolute mess, I now have the confidence in my tool paths to go on and cut aluminum chips. Setting the origin of a part is extremely easy with the wired XYZ probe. You simply position it at the corner of your stock and then run an automated procedure that will then become the zero of the workpiece. The origin is remembered through power cycling, so if you do multiple parts or operations in the same orientation, it will be ready to run. The unit also has a Z-height probe with a laser that will trace out the work as a nice sanity check to make sure that everything's aligned before we hit go. With all that out of the way, all that's left to do is send it. All right, so our first operation is done. Uh, basically what we did here was create a pilot hole for the center. We we're going to finish this with an eight and a half millimeter drill bit. Uh, it wasn't really gonna be worth proving a point to try to machine from both sides concentrically on this machine. Uh, hand drill, drill press, whatever. That's gonna be a lot easier just to blow that through the center. Uh, that's gonna be our oil feed passage. And then we rough cut some material on the corners and what this is gonna allow is ample clearance for the tool. So when we're cutting around on the tall part of the flange, or more importantly, all this excess material here, as we come through and cut, that'll make sure that we don't collide with the stop collar on our tool head. With this operation done, let's get the fourth axis set up and the workpiece clamped into place. So we did leave enough flat material on all four sides and that's going to locate and center this thing in our chuck. You see this operation doesn't know this material is missing, so it's still cutting air. You can see that the machine does cut actual chips. It's not just pushing material around, and it ends up creating a surprisingly smooth finish. This is by far the longest cutting procedure of the whole part and it's gonna take about 20 hours to run. 
You could knock a fair bit of time off this, but I went pretty conservative with a step over distance to keep heat out of the tool and have a nicer surface finish. There is no liquid coolant available on this machine, but it does offer air assist with an external compressor to blow on the cutting tool to evacuate chips and keep it cooler. Note that I do not have any of that set up for the entirety of this project. With phase two complete, we can now move on to the final operation. Since we eliminated all of the material that we initially clamped to in the vise and we need to correctly index the rotation of the part, I created a simple 3D printed holding fixture. And just make sure that you use a filament capable of withstanding higher temperatures as the aluminum can get pretty warm. Before final setup, we'll finish the through bore with a drill bit using the pilot hole from the first operation. This will also give the chip somewhere to go when the tapered oil inlet geometry is cut. So if we take a look at the finished part, you can see that there are some imperfections. These are the tool marks that are expected from the way that it was machined. However, these smoother finishes here were from a second pass that I took on the O-ring sealing surface to bring it into the final spec. Despite the fact that this never left the fourth axis chuck, and the second pass was generated by the same cam project on the same origin, somehow, some way, when it ran the job, it rotated the part by 45 degrees. This flat face was actually the side of the end mill cutting across the face rather than the edge of the surface here. Now this flat milled surface on the back is super smooth. You can't feel any of the tooling marks. Everything's nice and flush. Did a really nice job of machining the O-ring groove. The center hole is slightly offset and that's my fault from when I put it in the drill press. I drilled it a little bit fast. And remember when I said something about using filament suitable for higher temperatures? Yeah, well, that's the result. In full disclosure, Maycara did send this machine with no monetary exchange, but with the freedom to express my actual thoughts and feelings on the performance of the unit. My takeaway is that it's shown to be a pretty capable machine, so long as you plan to work within its limitations. By the example shown here, we were able to create a non-trivial part with O-ring seals and mounting holes and geometry that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to create without a CNC machine from the confines of your garage or shed. This isn't something that you're gonna be running mass production on, nor is it capable of replacing a $50,000 plus piece of shop equipment, but it is gonna give you the flexibility to machine fairly complex parts without relying on third-party vendors. The cost of entry starts around 2,500 bucks, and that's not a far cry from a larger 3D printer such as the Bamboo Lab H2D. That's gonna bring a fairly advanced level of manufacturing ability to your bench top. As with any tool, there's going to be a learning curve as to how to best utilize it, and the end result is ultimately going to come down to the person running the machine. I think the overall package did a really good job of making 
CNC machining accessible to the beginner, but there is still a ways to go if they wanted to make it as point and click easy as Bamboo Lab has made for 3D printing. But going back to some of my opening statements, that is an extraordinarily ambitious goal given the fact that the end success is going to start with the design of the part itself, not the machine that it's made on. So I think that'll wrap this one up. If you want to learn more about any of the stuff seen here, check out the links in the description. And if you made it this far, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you.